morning. Oh, thank you. Somebody does headspace, or my mum sent some friends along. So um, nice to see you all. Um, thanks. I mean, normally I get to kick off the second day of conferences. I think the assumption is that the night's normally quite heavy, and um, you need sort of bringing up a little bit the next morning. So it's nice to be here on day, day one. How many of you do some kind of meditation, mindfulness, something like that? I mean, that's amazing. Uh, you can't see because looking this way, but there's a lot of hands go up. That has, in the last 10 years, I cannot tell you how much that has changed. Maybe in California it's always been that way, but at least in England <laughs> it, was, it was very different. Um, how many of you, do, how many of you done, have done Headspace at some stage? Okay, again, quite a lot of you. So for those of you that do, I know a lot of people use Headspace to go to sleep as well as to relax. Um, there's often like a Pavlovian sort of response. If you can try and stay awake for the next sort of 45 minutes or so, that would be, that would be much appreciated. Um, so my main purpose here today is really to give you the tools that you need to live a healthy and happy life. And I think very often our, uh, I've noticed, especially we moved to the US probably about six years ago, there is a very heavy focus on it's kind of like work-life balance. It's not something I personally really kind of believe in or subscribe to. Um, because I think we spend so much time at work, I wouldn't like to think that we're trying to kind of balance those two out. I think our mind is our mind. We don't leave home and leave our mind at home and go to work. And equally, we don't leave all our work stuff at work and go home. It would be nice if we could, but we don't. So I think how we can kind of get our mind to a place where we're, as I say, healthy, happy, at ease, both at home and at work, wherever we are in our day. That's really sort of the goal. I was also asked to say a little bit about my own sort of journey. It's a weird thing if you, for all of us, I think, if you've lived a life yourself, there's nothing kind of unusual about it, really. It's just a life you've kind of lived. But on paper, every now and again, I have to write down kind of my life. And um, on paper, it looks a little strange. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, so I was a, a Buddhist monk for, for many years. I spent about 10 years of my life doing that. I went on and joined the circus, did a degree in circus arts. What else are you going to do when you leave the monastery? <laughs> all, it's famous. All Buddhist monks go on and become kind of circus artists. Um, and then you go on and sort of set up your own business and, you know, it becomes this thing. And so as I write these things down, I always kind of am reminded that on the outside it looks very sort of bizarre, but there is some context around it. And maybe it's useful to, to share some of that. So how many of you that did meditation? How many of you, how many did some as kids? Anybody do any meditation when they were little? Okay, so you'll know it was, it was quite unusual kind of back then to be doing meditation these days. It's amazing, my kids are in preschool. They're doing meditation. They start every day with mindfulness. By the way, I did try, people often ask, do I do it with my own kids? Are you familiar with Peppa Pig? The, the cartoon? Okay. So, a treat at night for my son is getting the iPad, not to watch, but to listen to audio stories. He likes to listen to Peppa Pig. And um, one evening, someone had said to me at work during the day, do you do meditation with your kids? And I was thinking, well, he's, you know, he's like three, four, I should probably give it a go, actually. I have this company, you know. Um, so, I said that we're going to do something different tonight, and put the, put the iPad on. And he started listening. And he just looked at me and he said, but daddy, that's, that's just you. And I said, yeah. And he said, no, nah, I'd rather listen to Peppa Pig. <laughs> so I think in the future I'll do that slightly differently with him. But I was lucky. I was 10 when I started um, meditation. I had a mum who was very progressive, um, who just came out of a divorce, and who was looking for a way to cope. And I think we all have times in our life when... We're looking for ways to cope. And she went along to this meditation class, and me and my sister, we didn't really want to be left at home, so we went with her. And it was interesting. I think, like, as a teenage, well, a 10-year-old boy, it was very difficult. It wasn't something I could discuss with my friends. I couldn't tell my friends about it. I did tell one friend, actually. He was like my best childhood friend who I really trusted, because I knew he wasn't going to tell anybody at all. I went into school the next day, 
and everyone was sat cross-legged on the, on the desk, kind of giving it this. Um, so I actually, for quite a long time, like a lot of people I think back then, kind of stayed in the sort of the meditation closet and didn't tell anyone that I did it. And yet it's such a, it's such a sort of valuable skill. Thankfully now, sort of more people are talking about it. So anyway, fast forward a few years, I did it throughout my teens. Um, I was involved in a, a car accident where a couple of friends died. Um, my stepsister was killed in a car accident as well. And I was left, I think in many ways, sort of trying to work out how to, how to cope. And I share those things with you, not because I think they're unusual. I think we all deal with tragedy. I think tragedy comes in many different shapes and forms. It's more kind of how we deal with it. So I went away and became a Buddhist monk. That's not my recommendation for when tragedy arises in your life. Um, although, if you're interested, come see me afterwards. I, can, uh, I, know some, I know some people. But I think if I look at our group of friends who were involved in those things, so some turned to drugs, some turned to alcohol. Uh, I gave both a go. They didn't work for me, but they did for some for a little bit. The interesting thing for me was that every, no matter how good a night you have, like no matter how much you distract yourself temporarily, eventually, well, the next morning usually, you wake up and realize, oh, okay, well, I'm still here. My mind's still here, the thoughts are still here, my feelings are still here. So there's no real way of kind of outrunning them. So having stayed in one place and tried to distract myself for a few, well, probably for a few months, I thought, okay, well, maybe I can outrun my mind. And I, didn't, I don't mean that sort of as a conscious thought, but I thought if I traveled, if I ran away, I could maybe get away from the thoughts that I was experiencing. And I gave it a good go, to be fair. I spent about two or three years traveling and um, eventually realized, okay, well, that's not going to work either. So I started a, a degree in sports science. So I was very, I competed in gymnastics, did lots of sports. Seemed like an obvious choice. About a year and a half in, I realized that there was nothing that was really going to give me that sense of purpose, sense of fulfillment that I was looking for in my life. So I went into university, and by the way, you might be thinking, like, how do you how do you go from being at university to being a monk? And it was a really difficult thing for my family and my friends to understand. For me personally, it was a really easy decision. I made the decision one afternoon. Uh, I hadn't been thinking about it, not consciously. There were no pros and cons of being a Buddhist monk in my notebook. I just, it seemed like a good idea. And I remember telling my friends, my family, I think my dad thought I was joining a cult. Uh, my mum was surprisingly supportive, actually. Uh, a little bit worried that she wasn't going to have any grandchildren, but other than that, she was, she was very supportive. And my friends, I think they didn't know what to make of it. I went into university that afternoon. I spoke to my, my head of, sort of, the head of the course. And I told him, and he said, you know, you're really going to regret this for the rest of your life. It's a, at best, just go and see your doctor maybe kind of get some Prozac, something like that, and see how you feel. Uh, it was an interesting idea. It was quite representative of that time, I think. Definitely what I was looking for was not going to be found in a bottle of medication. Um, and it happens to be the single best decision I've made in my entire life that I'm deeply, deeply grateful for. So I went off, and about two months later, I went and became a, a Buddhist monk. So you're probably thinking, how did you become a Buddhist monk? Um, well, this was before, you can't Google it. So this was like, I don't know, was it the 1980s or something like that? Um, and I, there was no way of kind of, I didn't know any Buddhist monks. So I bought a Lonely Planet book, if you remember those things. And I looked up sort of the Himalayas, and I was reading through it, and I saw where the Dalai Lama lived. I thought, that's a good place to go. This is true, by the way. This was the extent of my research, how to become a Buddhist monk. There's probably a niche area of it. There's probably a book to be written here somewhere, actually. I think about it. Um, so anyway, so I flew off to, to northern India. Uh, I did some training. Um, I ended up doing five years in the Burmese school, actually, rather than um, Tibetan school. And then did five years in the Tibetan school um, afterwards. I got to live in lots of different countries in 
Burma, in northern India, in Nepal. I was in, in a monastery in Russia for a while, um, a Tibet, Tibetan Buddhist monastery in Scotland, in a retreat for a year. So lots of different teachers, lots of different countries. Um, and what for me was a, a fascinating sort of journey, not everybody's cup of tea, I'll cry on you. Um, people often ask, kind of, what does a, a day or a, a week or a year entail? So um, it won't take me long to describe, <laughs> because you get up, you cross your legs, you close your eyes, and then you go to bed at the end of the night. It's, it's interesting in some ways, stay with me, um, it is interesting, it's, um, because when you first go there, you kind of think, like, there's a, there is a honeymoon phase. There's a romance to it. Because you leave everything behind. I cannot imagine what it would be like now. So even then, before digital and social and everything else and mobile phones, even then it felt quite romantic. Now, I mean, it would feel like a complete escape from everything, I would imagine. But you go there, and for the first couple of weeks, it's quite magical. Everything slows down. You know, finally, you say, oh, wow, this is, this is what I've been looking for. And then a couple of weeks go by, and it's kind of like, is, what do I do now? Just keep meditating. And, and you suddenly realize, wow, there is nowhere to go. There is nothing to do. There are no books to read. There's no one to talk to. You couldn't pick up the phone. You could pick up the phone, but you'd have to walk a couple of miles down to a local village, try and borrow some money from somewhere and phone up an international place. There was just no way of doing anything like that. So then you get to an interesting point, which in some way kind of, I think, encapsulates what for me is meditation, which is not silencing the mind, because we're never going to silence the mind. That's not the goal of meditation. It's more can we get to a point of being comfortable with the mind as it is, no matter whether it's busy, whether it's slow, whether we like the thoughts, whether we don't like the thoughts. So as you stay there in the monastery, you start to realize that actually the skill is sitting there and getting comfortable with the mind as it is. And it's really challenging. But because there is nowhere to go, because there is no escape, it's kind of no choice. So you have to kind of surrender a little bit. You have to let go a little bit. And for me, that is the heart of meditation. When we sit there and we kind of let go of all of our thinking, we let go of trying to do something or be someone or be different, and we just allow the body and the mind to be as it is. So we are going to do a little bit of, a little bit of that today. Um, we'll do it in just a moment. I realized I, I teed up in my um, intro that I, I made the mistake of mentioning the circus. Circus is complicated. We can go there if you want, but it's, it feels like it, it's not necessarily in line with everything else I've done with my life. It kind of is. I don't think I would, I would have gone on to do Headspace had I not gone to, to the circus. I'd try and do this bit really, really quickly. So the monastery had sent me to, to Russia to teach. It was at the end of my 10 years. I stopped being a monk. I hadn't done any exercise for 10 years. I was, before, before that, I'd been competing in athletics and, i say, gymnastics. I was desperate to do something physical again. So when I finished my time, I had six months in Moscow when I wasn't a monk, but I was in Moscow. A friend of mine was studying at Moscow State Circus, and he said, well, look, if you want to do something physical, why don't you come to one of my classes? So I went along to Moscow State Circus. And I realized that, wow, I really miss this. I really enjoyed that kind of physicality. And the guy said, well, look, you know, you can, you can actually do a degree in this in London. And at this stage of my life, as a monk, you give away everything. Everything. So I didn't have any clothes. I didn't have anything. And I was thinking, how am I going to go back? I knew what I wanted to do in terms of teaching meditation, but I didn't know how I was going to go back to England and actually do it. And I realized, as uh, I don't know if you have this in America, but as mature, they call it a mature student. Um, if you're, um, I'm not sure I quite fit the mature bit, but um, I went back to England, you, you actually get given some money, so they pay for your education, they even give you some money to kind of live. So I, was, I started to think about this, like this could actually work out all round. So I went back to England, did a degree in circus arts, and in the evenings and at the weekends I wrote the content which is now on the Headspace app. And what was interesting for me was getting, getting back into the body. As a monk you become a little bit kind of shy. I think you spend a lot of time just on your own with your eyes closed. It's a very, you feel like a little bit kind of separate from, from the world sometimes. So it was like diving right back into the deep end of life and becoming very physical again. And as I say, I found it enormously, enormously helpful. 
wind on about a month, I met a guy called Rich Pearson, who's the co-founder of Headspace. He's really the, the brains behind Headspace, I would say. And we're now 10 years on. We have about 60 million people on the, on the platform in the community. Um, but I did say 10 years. So it was like that classic overnight success. It's, um, you wouldn't believe how many people kind of come up and say to us, oh, wow, it's amazing. It's all just happened in the last, what, like year two? And Rich and I just like, look at each other, kind of having aged about 20 years in the last five. Go, yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, it's interesting. It's been, it's been fascinating. I, I do sometimes look back at the days of being a monk. Just give me a minute just to think back to those times. It, they were simpler times. They were nice. Sometimes I find myself at work doing that. Sometimes I find myself in the midst of the kids running around, punching me, kind of thinking that. And at the same time, I would never want to go back there. Not, I wouldn't, I didn't like it, I loved it. But that was that time, and this is this time. And I think we spend so much time in life Either looking back, perhaps thinking that the time was better, that we wish we could go back, or looking forward, hoping that something will be different in the future. But actually, we never really spend very much time right now, in this moment, content with where we are in the world. And that doesn't mean just, you know, say, just going with the flow and saying nothing matters. Of course, everything matters. But at the same time, we can only really achieve our best if we are in this moment. Anything else is just thinking. If we go into the past, it's thinking. If we go into the future, it's thinking. The only thing that actually exists is this moment right now. So the training in meditation, in mindfulness, even if it's in the monastery, is not to learn how to sit still with your eyes closed. It's not a very useful skill in life. It's fine, but it's not very useful in terms of application to everyday life. It's to learn how to take, how to familiarize yourself with the present moment to such an extent that you can then apply it to every single moment of your day. So that's why a lot of the monasteries, that you're not necessarily like a monk or a nun forever. They actually encourage you to go back into the world and to, to apply that and to integrate that into your life. So, with that in mind, I could stand here and bore you silly all day long talking about life in a monastery. I'd really like to kind of actually show you the exercise, the, the skill that I, I think will be helpful. But there are a few little things I'd like to just sort of tee up in advance, if I may. So, there's three things actually. So the number one is that most people think that meditation is about stopping your mind. It's not. I promise you, if you sit there trying to stop your mind, trying to stop your thoughts, you will probably feel quite disappointed you probably feel like you're not doing it right, and you will probably give up meditation forever. Like, it does not work. Just because you are sat there with your eyes closed, and I'm stood here saying, let's do something called meditation, there is no reason why your mind should suddenly stop thinking. It has always thought. If you could stop it from thinking, you would have already stopped it from thinking. I promise you. Okay, so number one, expectation. Your mind will continue to think, and that's okay. Number two, how many of you here struggle to, with sleep every once in a while? I'm assuming that most of you, probably at some stage. Okay, how many of you have had something really important the next day and struggled to go to sleep because of that? Okay, and what's happened when you have tried harder to go to sleep? <laughs> doesn't work, right? Just doesn't work. So I think in that way, meditation and mindful, uh, sleep and, and meditation and mindfulness is very, very similar. There's, you can't force yourself to a point of relaxation. You can't force yourself to let go. All you can do is create the conditions. It's like at night time, maybe coming off the screen a little bit earlier, maybe lying down, you pull the curtains, everything. You, you create an environment in which you are more likely to let go and fall asleep. In the same way, in meditation, we try and create the conditions in which the mind is more likely to let go. That's all we're doing. What the mind does and chooses to do, that's up to the mind. Last one, number three. So there's an analogy that we um, use a lot on the Headspace app around blue sky. So I think very often, when people sit to meditate, there's an idea that we should be experiencing a certain quality of mind, 
It's almost like we have an idea of what we think meditation is, but that idea is born from thinking. So it's not really to be trusted. So <laughs> the way I think about it is, or the way it was explained to me by my teachers, is as, as the blue sky. So the blue sky is always there. In California, this works, by the way, much better in London, because we have clouds all, all the time. So people don't believe the blue sky is there all the time. You're in California. The blue sky is here all the time. But stay with me. So the blue sky is there all the time. Now, even on a cloudy day, if we get in a plane and we fly up through the clouds, the blue sky is still there. But on a cloudy day, when the mind is very busy, when there's a lot of thoughts about, we kind of forget about the blue sky, and we assume that we have to try and create blue sky, that we have to try and sort of control the weather in some way. So the temptation when we sit to meditate is to try and create what we think is meditation rather than simply sitting there, focusing on the breath and allowing the blue sky to naturally appear. So, know the thoughts will continue. Know that it doesn't require a lot of effort. Arguably, it requires no effort at all. And lastly, you don't need to create the blue sky. The blue sky, that feeling of happiness, contentment, fulfillment, however you think about it, that already exists in our mind. All we need to do is to create the conditions for the clouds to, to part a little bit. So with those three things in mind, you can now get them out of your mind, you can let go of them, don't need to hold on to them. Um, if you could just make yourself comfortable, I'm not going to get you sitting cross-legged or anything crazy like that. You're going to sit on your seats, ideally arms and legs uncrossed. I'm assuming your, your phones are already off. If they're not, if you can make sure they're off. If you're holding, and sorry about the long list of things, this is based purely on many previous events when all of these things have happened. If you're holding a hot cup of coffee or tea in your hand and there's the possibility of it <laughs> emptying on your lap, if you could put it on the floor, that would be good as well. And if you're standing up at the back, you can join in too. Um, I would suggest, though, if you're not leaning against the wall, that you don't close your eyes, just in case. All right. So the first thing I'd like you to do, I'm just going to step to the side here, just for this first part of the exercise. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to look directly forward. So when you do this, I don't need to stare at one particular point. I'd like you to try and take in the entire space around you. So it'll have to be a really soft focus where you can see everything around you, but you can't see any one thing clearly. So just a very soft focus with the eyes. And just maintaining that for a few seconds. I'd like you to take a big deep breath, breathing in through the nose. And out through the mouth. And again in through the nose. And out through the mouth. And this time as you breathe out, just gently closing the eyes. And as you close the eyes, just taking a moment just to enjoy that feeling of having nothing to do, nowhere to go, having paused, feel the weight of the body pressing down against the seat beneath you. soles of the feet on the floor and just the weight of the hands, the arms resting on the legs. Again, remember just allow thoughts to come and go, but just bring your attention into your body. Notice how the body feels this morning, whether there's an obvious sense of heaviness or lightness. Perhaps a feeling of restlessness or stillness.
And as you become more aware of the body, just starting to notice the breath as well. So that feeling of movement in the body. So you don't have to breathe in any special way. The body knows how to breathe. If you can feel that movement of breath, sometimes people get it in the chest, sometimes it's the diaphragm, sometimes it's the stomach. If you can't feel any movement, just gently placing your hand on your stomach. Again, know that it's normal for the mind to wander. Doesn't matter what the thoughts are, as soon as you realize your thinking, just acknowledging it letting it go and coming back to the breath again. And we're just going to stay here for the next minute or so. Just gently focused on that rising and falling sensation of the breath. If you find it easier, you can count the breaths as they pass. So one with the rising sensation two with a falling sensation, then three, then four, just up to a count of ten, and then starting again at one. The thoughts come, we see the distraction, we acknowledge it, let it go, and come back to the breath again. And then just for the next few seconds, I'd like you to let go of any focus on the breath. Okay, let go of any focus on anything. For the next few seconds, just let your mind do whatever it wants to do. So if it wants to think, let it think. So now really nothing to do at all. just very gently bringing the attention back to the body. Just coming back to that feeling of weight again, that feeling of contact. And whenever you're ready, you can just gently open the eyes again. Okay, so, everyone okay, first of all, yeah, okay. How many of you maybe feel a little more tired than you did before? Okay, so, I phrased that in a particular way. Very often, people will say when they meditate, I feel more tired afterwards. Just to be clear, the meditation doesn't make you tired. That exercise is not the thing that made you tired. That exercise was the thing that showed you how tired you feel. <laughs> it's really important differentiation. In the same way, if at the end of a meditation you perhaps feel a little frustrated, 
a little anxious, or whatever it might be. The exercise has not made that happen. I promise you. I've practiced it a lot. Focusing on our breath doesn't make any of those things happen. But it does show us what is happening underneath. It is a practice in awareness. That's all it is. We become more aware. And normally we are so caught up in our everyday life that we're not aware of how we feel. We're not always aware of what we're thinking either. And it's not until we do stop, which is why so often people lie down on their bed, they hit the pillow, and they say, suddenly my mind is full of thoughts. Mm, it's not so sudden. The mind has been full of thoughts all day long. It's just that we've had to kind of keep them at bay because we're focusing on just living life. So it's really important just to always give it that context. And because of that, there is no such thing as good or bad meditation. So you can never give yourself a hard time and say, I'm no good at this. I'm going to give up. There is no good or bad meditation. There is either focusing on the breath or not focusing on the breath. To begin with, there is not much focusing on the breath. There is a lot of distraction. Over time, there is more focusing on the breath. And in a little bit more time, you will find that actually it's quite easy to focus on the breath. Sure, you'll still get distracted once in a while, but it won't disturb you, it won't bother you, and you'll be able to take that skill into the most difficult situations in your life, regardless of whether those happen at work or at home. So that's my hope. Um, by the way, I don't know if you do know, but Sotheby's has very kindly, generously um, bought annual subscriptions for Headspace for all of you. Um, so, to your company. So my recommendation, obviously I'm a little biased as the founder of Headspace, my recommendation would be to use them. Um, but more than that, you know, if, if you are someone sitting in the audience, and I would fully ant anticipate that there are a few people in the audience thinking, eh, it's nice, probably not for me, maybe I can sell it on eBay. Um, you can try. Um, or whatever you use these days, on a Craigslist maybe. Um, I would say this, just... 10 days, I think, is realistic. So we, we do a lot of research at Headspace. We have a team of 15 scientists, healthcare specialists, doctors who are working kind of in, in research, trying to better understand how meditation works. Um, and we know a lot happens in the first 10 days. So even if you're someone who's very skeptical, like, try it. Try it for 10 days. Prove to yourself. Yeah, absolutely, I was right, it doesn't work. That's fine. But make sure you give it the time. Make sure you try it. Our mind is the most valuable resource we have. And I think if we don't look after it, if we don't take the time to look after it, then we're really sort of not giving ourselves the, the best, best chance to be happy and healthy in life. Now, I know there was a little bit of time um, at the end to do some, some q and A. I don't know. It can be about anything. It can be about the science of meditation. It can be meditation in the workplace. It can be how do I become a monk or a nun, anything at all. You can feel free to, to ask. Does anybody have any questions? Even if you do, I wouldn't be able to see. I can see absolutely nothing. I can see, yeah, you down there, sir. Uh, so what did you end up doing in the circus? It's a great question. So what did I end up doing in the circus? So my friends like to think that I put on a red nose and cycled around on a tricycle throwing buckets of glitter at people. I didn't. It wasn't that kind of circus. Um, I did two things. So I had two, two, you major and you minor like any other university. I had two. I did straps, which is a bit like um, rings in men's gymnastics, where you kind of roll up and, you know, do that thing. Um, and then I had um, something called sports acro. So I had a, a young German partner um, who would do sort of handstands on my head and, you know, and up that, that kind of thing. So, again, really useful in life. <laughs> you... <laughs> You'd be amazed how often I'm in meetings and I, I oh, would you mind just sort of just climbing up onto my head? No. Yeah, the meditation was definitely the more useful bit, which is kind of a surprise, right? Most people back then, they wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. My daily meditation practice now is uh, considerably different than before I had children. So before having children, I would get up every day. I kind of... I think, in a way, once a month, kind of always a month, I, I would get up at sort of 4, 4.30, I'd do my meditation, and oh, those, were the, those were the days. We, I'd get up, I'd meditate, I'd go and surf, and then we'd go to work. And, 
Um, now my children just attack me in the morning, and um, I normally do my meditation at lunchtime. So um, I still do. When you're a monk, you make a series of commitments to practice meditation, certain meditations, not just while you're at the monastery, but for the rest of your life. So when you leave the monastery, they give you short form practices of those. Otherwise, I'd need about 10 hours before going to work. Um, so I sit and I, I go through those. They take about half an hour, and then I do something called resting awareness, which is where you just sit, but not focused on the breath or any other object of meditation. You just allow your mind to be aware of itself without any object of, of focus. Yeah. Yes, sir. I noticed in the exercise that my breath when I was focusing on it, yeah. it kind of felt it was short. Yes. And I didn't know if it was an anxiousness, whatever. Any yeah, so it, it, can, it can be. Um, very often, it's a really interesting thing. And I, I'm going to show you um, some walking meditation very briefly just to make the, make the analogy. So, although the body knows how to breathe, when we focus on the breath, for some reason, we kind of get in the way of it, because we're not doing anything else, it's like, I've got to do something, and we start to interfere with the breath. So it's really, really common. And you see it most with walking meditation. So walking meditation is normally, sort of, when, it, when you slow it right down, it's kind of something, sort of, maybe a little bit slower than this, but for the purpose of demonstration, kind of like this. Now when you teach walking meditation, it's really interesting, you say to people, okay, I just want you to walk in a normal way, but walk slower. And all of a sudden, you start looking around the room, and <laughs> people are doing sort of this. And it's like the Ministry of Funny Walks in Monty Python, for any of you that know it. So that is exactly what's happening to the breath normally. So it's not that the, and it's just getting comfortable with it, knowing that there's nothing to do. So it, sometimes it can show us that there's a bit of underlying kind of restlessness. But all of these things, I would say, if you stick with it for a number of days, it starts to slow down, you start to relax into it, and everything is, everything is good. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes? How do you recommend getting kids involved? I, like I said, I definitely recommend getting kids involved. So in the, in the app, so you, when, you, when you open it up, you'll find Headspace for Kids. Um, right now we work with about, 100 and, I think it's about 110 school district, Department of Education, and we use it with kids as young as, I think it's four and five. How old are your children? Nine and 21. Nine and 21, okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big difference. Um, with a 21-year-old, I would say don't encourage them too much. Just kind of leave it lying around and say, oh, I heard of this thing the other day. Go and check it out. Like, genuinely, I think it's, it's really important that we never kind of push meditation on anyone, and I would say that's right in the area where people don't want to be pushed too much. But I do think it's a, an, a time which is incredibly valuable to learn a skill like that. Are they into sports or anything, or science, or, or science? Okay, so look, this is true not just for kids, but for anyone. Look for the hook. What is the thing that's going to grab that person? So like, I, I know some people who have zero interest in meditation, and then Time Magazine did a massive thing on the science of meditation, and it's like, oh, it's real, kind of, oh, it does work. Oh, it changes the brain. Oh, okay, I'll give it a go. I have other friends who, they use that same magazine as to light a fire. They had no interest in that whatsoever. Uh, they're in, into sport. And we did a partnership with the NBA. We have one with Nike. And when we talk about the athletes that we work with and the teams we work with in the world, they're like, oh, wow, if they're doing it, I'm going to do it. So I find with kids very often, it's kind of finding their, whether it's sporting heroes or people of culture, who are doing those things and saying, hey, look, this is, this is interesting. Check with the school as well. If your school isn't doing it, we make it free to all educators, all schools. So make sure your school gets in touch with us and we can, we can help out getting it into the classroom as well. Oh, yes. What are some of your My favorite books? Of a meditation persuasion? Yeah, or? Sure. Okay. Um, so I, let me give you two or three. So um, it's always a balance. So I don't want to give you like a hardcore Tibetan Buddhist kind of things, because maybe not that accessible, but Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, I would recommend to everybody, regardless of whether you have any interest in Buddhism, meditation, or anything like that. It's a really, really good book. It, it's about three pages um, per chapter, which is kind of ideal for our society right now. And it's not quite Twitter, but it's close. And he somehow creates this feeling as though you're just zooming out 
from your life, from, from the world. And it gives a real nice feeling and perspective. It's a great way to start the day, just reading a chapter of that. Um, another one I like is called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. So I think there was, um, it was written back in the 70s, I think, maybe 80s. Um, but there was a, I think there is a trend still to almost kind of take on the identity of, oh, I meditate, I must be spiritual, I'm very special. It's almost as though we are losing one identity and taking on another identity. And, and for me, like, I don't relate to any, any of that. If spiritual means a sustained focus to being more present with an open mind and a kind heart, being more compassionate, then sure, we could call it spiritual. I think we could call it anything, is the truth. I would say the, the biggest kind of danger or trip, even, in kind of going on, on that kind of journey is that we, yeah, we, we kind of add a layer of identity. I'd say meditation is about shedding that stuff. It's about letting go of any kind of identity, not needing to be anyone, not needing to present ourselves to the world in a particular way, but just being authentic, being ourselves, showing up, and letting other people make up their mind whether that works for, for them or not. So that's, I really, really like both those two books. One's a bit, second one's a bit more instructional, first one's a bit more kind of philosophical in nature. First book is Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by a Zen teacher called Suzuki Roshi. I do the spellings, but I can't. I need to write them down, sorry. Um, and the second book um, is Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by a Tibetan teacher called um, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. I know, easy to write down. You know, it's fine. <laughs> but, but if you just look for the title, it's on Amazon. Yeah, it's, they're not super rare books. Yes, sir. Definitely. So, so my, obviously my own practice is a little different to the, um, what's on the app. The app starts at three minutes. I'd recommend if you've done no meditation before, that you, regardless, even if you think you can do longer, that you do three minutes, then try five minutes, then try ten minutes. I would say the optimum is around ten minutes. We know certain things happen in the body, something called the relaxation response, around kind of the eight, nine, ten minute mark. So if you could do ten minutes once a day, game changer. Like genuinely, it will start to change the way you feel, and it also causes some changes in the in the brain and the physiology of the body. Um, if you could do that a couple of times a day, you'll be flying. I think um, so. I would try not literally levitating. Don't get, I'm not making <laughs> not making any claims or promises here. I don't know. Um, but no, you'll it will really change the way you feel. I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I would definitely, uh, using the app is a little bit like learning to drive, I would say. Um, and at least when I learned to drive, it was really nice to have someone sat in the seat next to me, kind of giving me a bit of, a bit of guidance. I think once you've built up some familiarity with that, then alongside those, you can just pause for 30 seconds and just focus on the breath. You don't necessarily need to, to use the app. Um, but yeah, I, I would say a combination, a combination of the two. But you, you'll get all that guidance within the app. It'll actually tell you how best to, how best to use it. I think we've got time for one or two more. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most interesting thing in the scientific research, so yeah, we've got about, I think we have about 75 papers kind of in, in the line right now. I think we've published about 20, 25 of them. I think some of the more interesting ones, um, so uh, just 10 days of using Headspace, 10 minutes a day, increases focus by 14%. So let's, like, that was way more than I was expecting. So in, with sports teams and things like that, that's a really kind of interesting thing to, to work with. I think probably the biggest thing, though, well, actually, there's some other nice stuff kind of as well around sort of com increasing compassion and reducing aggression and irritability and that kind of thing, which I think is, you might have seen on Twitter recently, there's some stuff in the world. Um, I think it would be, it would be good. Um, and then, uh, what's the other thing? Uh, yeah, so for me, the most fascinating thing was that when we meditate, it's not just the mind, the psychology of the mind that's changing. It is our brain. So in the same way that when we go to the gym and we work a muscle and the muscle gets thicker and stronger, the area of the brain associated with feelings of happiness and well-being, that actually gets thicker and stronger. It receives more blood flow, so the cells kind of regenerate more quickly. And because it gets thicker and stronger, we spend more time there. 
So it's a very kind of, you know, the, yeah, exactly, it, go, it goes round. And I had no idea that was happening. Yeah. How do drugs and alcohol help or hinder? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do they hinder? Was that the question? Of how do they factor in? So look, I, I think, um, and I, I, must, I must wrap up, but what I found working in the clinic, so before Headspace I did about uh, two years of just working in a clinic doing one-to-one -one with people, and people would come along and they'd say kind of, oh, the meditation is kind of working, but I'm not sure kind of how, you know, I'm not getting as much benefit as I thought I was. And I'd say to them, okay, so tell me, kind of, you know, what's your week been like, or what did you do last night? And this was in the financial district of London, and they were mostly traders, and... And they'd come in and, and genuinely, and they'd be like, well, I went out last night with the lads. I said, did you drink? I'm like, yeah, quite a lot. Do you do any drugs? Yeah, I did a bit of coke. And I'm like, oh, really? Oh, and your meditation didn't go that well this morning. I think, don't be surprised if your meditation doesn't go very well after lines of coke. It's, it's, it just won't. A little bit of coffee in the morning, yeah, that'll get you going, and it might keep you awake during your meditation. No cocaine. So, um, I think inevitably we see with alcohol and, and drugs, um, not only a, a disruption to that practice, but also it creates obviously a, a whole bunch of dependencies that there's, there's not time to, to go into right, right now. But yeah, I, I would say just try, it doesn't mean you don't have to be, in order to practice meditation, you don't have to be, you don't have to live like a monk or a nun. You can drink, I drink alcohol, not from the bottle, um, but I will, I will have a glass or two of something once in a while, and it doesn't, it doesn't interfere. I think it's all about kind of moderation and, and finding a middle way. I'd love to do, I know there's a few more questions out there. They're probably actually going to come and pick me up and take me off the stage if I don't get off. So thank you so much for having me today. Enjoy your conference. Thank you.